Thank you all for joining us for the Microsoft's Ignite Table Topics. Um, Azure Kubernetes Service Fundamentals is what we'll be talking about today. Before we start, I just have a few quick things to go over. I'm going to share a link in the chat to our reactor check in. Um, if you have a few moments and can check in, please do so. Please also. Um, we ask the reactor code of conduct. We ask that you be kind and respectful to everyone, including our speakers. We want the reactors to be a place where everybody feels welcome. You can ask questions using the chat or feel free to raise your hand and come off mute when the speaker calls on you. We ask that when you are not asking a question to please stay on mute so we can limit any background noise. In the chat, I'll also be sharing some links to the reactor meetup page and monthly newsletter. If you're interested in checking out what other sessions we have coming up, um, there are more table topic, table topic sessions coming up this week as well. So I will share a link to that series page. Today's session will be added to the reactor YouTube channel in about 24 to 48 hours. So in case you can't join us for the whole time or you want to share it with somebody else. And finally, towards the end, I will be sharing a link to our reactor survey. If you have a few minutes, we greatly appreciate your feedback. And I am now going to pass it over to Rob and Roy. Great, thanks for joining us. I'm really excited to be able to talk through some of the things that I've really enjoyed with Azure Kubernetes Service and also the other platforms where we host Docker content on Azure. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Rob Richardson. I'm a Microsoft MVP, a Docker captain, and a friend of Redgate. And so it's been a lot of fun getting to explore Azure Kubernetes service. Roy, do you want to say hi? Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, my name is Roy Kim. Uh, I'm a uh, Azure Microsoft uh, MVP. I've uh, been MVP for five years and uh, work with, uh, I'm an IT and a consultant. I work with large organizations. Uh, you know, just getting into the cloud on various uh, cloud solutions, and also it's involved. It has involved with uh, Azure Kubernetes um, uh, as well, and would love to share kind of my thoughts, my experiences with uh, with AKS. So, um, without no further ado, let's let's jump into our fir first uh, um, table talk. Table talk. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, so, do you, uh, Rob? You wanna? Let's start off on this one. Sure. The slide hasn't updated for me yet. What's the topic that we're going to discuss? Um, yep. Uh, OK, so oh, you don't see it? You don't see me switching? Ah, slides? table topic, Azure Kubernetes. Nope, it hasn't switched for me yet. Maybe my screen is frozen? Um, let's see here. I don't know. Dion, Dion do you see uh, the conversation prompt slide? It has not switched for me either. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Can you read it to us? No, no. You know what? Let me try this. Uh, okay. How about now? Yes. I okay. see your picture and mine. Perfect. Okay. And then I. Okay. How about the conversation from uh, yes. the places to run containers in Azure, ATS Web Apps, ACI? Yeah, one of the questions that I often get as people start to approach Azure is, which service should I use to be able to run my containers? Now, the beautiful thing in Azure is that we have lots of places to run containers. Azure Kubernetes Service is a managed Kubernetes instance that uses uh, upstream Kubernetes, and the control plane is managed for us, which is really elegant. Alternatively, we could use Azure Web Apps, which allows us to host containers, both Linux and Windows containers, and it automatically scales things for us. Or we could use Azure Container Instance, which is a REST API that allows us to spin up containers really fast. And there's lots more places where we could spin up containers on Azure. And so then the magic question is, well, which one should I use? <laughs> if you're spinning up um, just one big service, maybe you're just lifting your um, monolith into the cloud, then Azure Container or Azure Web Apps is a really good place to be able to host this. Now, each microservice, each container is going to need a separate Azure Web App. And so you'll end up filling up a subscription pretty easily. But if you only have one big monolith, this might be the perfect place to be able to upload that content. Azure Container Instance, by comparison, is a REST API that allows you to just really quickly spin up a container and spin it down. 
If you just want to run some integration tests and you just want to fire up some containers, this might be the perfect way to do it. On the other end of the spectrum, if you want to build a service that runs containers, maybe you're building a multi-tenant service, then you could build all of the pieces associated with scaling up your containers, starting and stopping them. And Azure Container Instance is the great cloud native primitive to build that service on top of. And then Azure Kubernetes Service is that great place if you have lots of microservices. So if you have lots of little services and you want to run them all on regular native Kubernetes, then Azure Kubernetes Service or AKS is a great choice. So I generally look to that. If I've got a monolith, uh, only one microservice, I'll use Azure Web Apps. If I have many microservices, I'll use Azure Container Service. Now there's definitely other things like Service Fabric, spinning up Kubernetes on VMs, and all kinds of other ways. What's really cool here is that Azure has lots of different ways to run containers. And so I would say it's less about where should I run the containers and more, where does Kubernetes meet me where I am? Uh, or where does Azure meet me where I am? And the cool part here is Azure has lots of it options. If I'm cloud native and I'm running mostly on functions, then I could use Azure Functions. Or if I'm getting to that spot where I want to run functions inside of containers, then Azure Kubernetes Service is great. Ultimately, wherever you choose to run containers, they will run great on Azure. Awesome. So Rob, what's your what's your favorite that you'd like to use? What's my favorite? It really depends on the use case. I have a bunch of websites that I've actually got running inside of containers inside of web apps, which is really cool because I just uh, point web apps at my container. I point it at a particular tag, um, usually latest in my case, and it actually installs a webhook inside of Azure Container Registry. Anytime I push a new container to that registry with that label, it'll automatically update my web app. And I find that really helpful. Okay, At the cool. point where I reach a certain scale, then I'll flip over to Azure Kubernetes Service. Awesome. Yeah, like uh, I think that when you use uh, ACI web apps is good for um, so you're a, like a beginner trying to get feet, your feet wet with containers. Uh, I, I like AKS because uh, you can do a lot with it. It's more sophisticated, um, just like what you said, Rob. You know, uh, multiple microservices. Um, also deploy even operational services like observability, monitoring, logging, um, service buses, Redis cache, uh, all sorts, all sorts of things. So you get a little, you can build your really, you can build your little ecosystem there. So um, that's why that's why I like to use AKS. But that's for like very large, um, uh, sophisticated implementations. But but uh, but yeah, thanks a lot, Rob. That's awesome. Uh, does anybody? Yeah, definitely. Uh, does anybody out there have any questions or or want to share their experiences or what's their favorite to use? Anything in the chat? No. I, I One of the questions that. I often get here is, so I pick something else. <laughs> now what? Maybe they're on Mesosphere inside of ACS, and now what? <laughs> ACS has been deprecated some time, for some time, and so if you're still on Mesosphere inside of ACS, I'm actually really impressed. Um, other people find themselves on Azure Service Fabric, and if you're enjoying Azure Service Fabric, then that removes a lot of the complexity involved in building up uh, container orchestrator details. Um, Azure Service Fabric will solve that. So you don't need to move if, you, if you're not ready. But when you're ready to get to native Kubernetes, then AKS is a perfect fit. What makes AKS really helpful is that um, you don't pay for the control plane. That is a free managed control plane. And so you oh. only pay for the worker nodes that is doing the actual work for your service. Awesome. OK, thanks for that, Rob. OK, well, let's move on to the next conversation uh, prompt. Um, so, real-world use cases and tangible benefits using uh, Azure Kubernetes. Uh, okay, little little typo there. Um, so, uh, I, I like to share kind of some uh, real-world um, like kind of solutions or implementations, and kind of draw from and draw from that. Like, what are some benefits that I've seen? 
So um, I built a solution where um, it was kind of for like a little uh, startup, kind of their own um, social media platform, sharing pictures, sharing documents and, and things like that. So, you know, it was built on kind of uh, .NET Core, uh, some Node, right? And um, and some, uh, and, it, and I think uh, like a NoSQL database, I forgot what it was. It was, it was, a, it was a quite a few years ago. <clears throat> it was just kind of like a, kind of a prototype uh, uh, to get their uh, feet off the ground. And so, um, you know, uh, the reason for using that was the kind of the, um, the uh, micro to adopt the microservices architecture where they have a front, front end api tier and a back end tier and to able to scale independently um uh you know uh especially for the future as as they grow and gain more users and it was uh internet facing so um so so really i think a, a tangible benefit from there is that as you know they had a kind of a, a vision or horizon um, where because they're building a platform, right, and uh, of sharing uh, content and being content creators and uh, sharing that out uh, to users um, uh, that, you know, once they have other, introduced other microservices, then they can leverage AKS to, um, you know, host that, uh, those, those other services and, and features. So that's kind of... Um, uh, a benefit uh, from using that, right? And and with that, you don't have to be stuck on uh, a certain like uh, 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 application technology or language, like such as .NET. You can use kind of uh, Python as I mentioned. You can use Node. Um, you can you know use you know Go. You can use uh, just by any language because Stuff you know, is containers, right? And, uh, so, okay, okay, thank you. So that so that's a reason for uh, in that case. Another uh, use case uh, that I've been involved with was kind of more kind of a, a, a retail operations where uh, they're kind of barcode scanning, you know, um, across like uh, many hundreds of stores. And so performance and scalability was a key goal, right? So <clears throat> as uh, stores open up and, and then let's say there's a big kind of a, uh, a, like a holiday sale or Black Friday, Christmas, you know, they would be barcode scanning um, all their uh, product and materials, okay? Um, or kind of inventory tracking. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, so it was a fairly kind of, um, kind of medium-sized cluster, probably like, you know, maybe like four or five uh, nodes, uh, Kubernetes nodes, and really auto-scaling was a definite, um, uh, like, uh, benefit. Okay, so there's auto-scaling at the pod level, like horizontal pod auto-scaling, okay, well, and, and it had a microservice architecture, as well as um, uh, scaling up the nodes as well, right? So as a, first you have your horizontal pod auto scaling and that can, you know, uh, for each microservice and that, that may demand more compute, more CPU, more memory, and that would uh, auto scale to have more uh, replicas, okay, um, for that microservice. And as the, the nodes that are being hosted as, as uh, CPU memory consumption gets saturated, then Kubernetes cluster can also um, expand and scale out additional nodes, right? Which takes, you know, some some minutes, you know, uh, several minutes, and then also, and then from there, schedule out uh, additional uh, pods, you know, uh, for all those microservices. So that was a, a case where um, a really good benefit in terms of auto scaling and uh, optimized use of um, infrastructure. Okay, and you know. Uh, when it's not busy, using less. When you're more busy, then you know you use more. Um, but that wasn't the only kind of uh, benefit. But it was also having a, a also a ecosystem, right? So um, the ability ability to put like um, 
Redis Cache, uh, as well as uh, Prometheus and Grafana dashboards for monitoring solutions, um, and um, and uh, having Istio Service Mesh, as well as uh, Kiali for you know visualizing your service mesh. So there was a lot of um, kind of open source uh, software technology that uh, supporting the application. Okay, so. So that was really that was really awesome right, to have that all together and and and, and manage it very densely um, in, in one uh, hosting platform as AKS. So um, I'd like to open it up uh, if there's any questions or. Uh, I see a great question from Siegfried. Okay, Siegfried cool. is asking. Um, let me elaborate. I'm used to using Visual Studio to create Docker images on Docker Hub and then used with AKS. Can Visual Studio create ACIs and other containers for use with Kubernetes? Do you deploy them to Docker Hub? Yes. What's wonderful about containers is that when you create that Docker file, that Docker file will end up building an image. And that image runs wherever containers run. So you'll start that image as a container either on AKS or on Azure Web Apps or on on-prem clusters, Red Hat or op uh, OpenShift, on other clouds, that container will run anywhere containers run. Once you get that Docker file to build that image, you can push it to your Azure Container Registry. And now within your Azure Container Registry, any other service that happens to run containers can run this container as well. So right now, you probably have a mechanism inside Visual Studio where you're pushing that container to uh, your Azure Container Registry, and then maybe kicking the Azure Kubernetes service to get it started. That same process where you get the container into the registry and kick the service is the exact same process that you can use to push your image into the registry and start it on, for example, Azure Container Instance or Azure Web Apps. The cool part is that same container that you've got pushed into your container registry is the same container that will run anywhere. Now, if you have a Windows-based container, then you'll need to make sure that you're running it on a Windows node. And if you have a Linux-based container, you want to make sure that it's running on a Linux node. After that, everything just works. The cool part about Azure Web Apps is that um, that distinction starts to melt away. Once you've picked the type of operating system for your uh, Azure Web App subscription, then all of the instances, whether containerized or not, need to be that same operating system. But what's great is it's really easy to push .NET Core or .NET 5 and 6 apps into Linux containers. And most everything else runs on Linux as well, whether you have Redis or um, Kafka or Prometheus. Any of the other services will run great on Linux as well. So from Visual Studio or even better, from a DevOps pipeline like GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps, you can build up that mechanism to push your container to your registry and start it on your container runtime of choice. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Rob. There's another great question from Robert Steele. He says, can you talk more about paths to best scale an application up using Azure? Roy, do you want to jump in on that one? Um, repeat that, paths. Uh, what was that? Can you talk more about paths to best scale an application? Paths, uh, uh, the best way to scale for paths applications? Yeah, how do I configure Azure Kubernetes service to, for example, um, horizontally scale my pods? OK, so um, yeah, there's something called horizontal pod auto scaling. Uh, there's a YAML manifest there. So uh, you know, basically based on some kind of criteria, like uh, a threshold, like CPU usage, like you know, greater than 80 percent, then you know, expand um, your, your replicas. Right uh, to you know uh, you know increase by one or two um, you know up to a, a certain a defined limit. So that's kind of yeah that's how you use. So you just search up horizontal pod auto scaling, and you attach that to yeah your uh, one of your deployment objects, Kubernetes deployments right associated with that, and that's how you can get uh, horizontal pod auto scaling. Um, it's pretty, uh, it's not that hard, not that sophisticated, but yeah, uh, feel free to check that out. Expanding on Robert Steele's question, why do I have to pick the type of auto scale? Do, why can't I just push the auto scale button? Why do I have to select CPU or request queue length? 
Well, I don't know. in my mind, I think you have to uh, define what your auto scaling is based on, right? Um, um, you know, I, you know, like I think uh, it's a, it, it has to be, an, it depends, right? You, you know, you want to auto scale yeah. for the right reasons, you know, based on CP memory usage or IO ops, like Q lengths and stuff like that. So that's my um, thought, thought process on that. Uh, hopefully, maybe that answers your question. Yeah, there. definitely. Yeah. And it does really depend on your application because if you have an IO bound application, then you want to auto scale based on IO. If you have a compute bound application, then you want to auto scale based on compute resources. If you have an IO bound application that doesn't use very much CPU and your auto scale is based on CPU usage, of course it's never going to auto scale beyond the minimum. And so then your application won't perform very well. So you're really tuning the auto scale to match your application so that it can scale correctly to the use case that you have. Awesome. Mahesh asked a great question. What kind of approach is recommended when the web app is containerized, but the database is on-prem? That's a really great question, because it's really easy to containerize your application, and then you want to push that up to the cloud, but it's like, my application needs to reach out to my database to be able to get my data in place. How do I make that work? Well, there's a couple of options that you have. And great question, Mahesh. The first step is that you don't necessarily need to run your containers in the cloud. You may choose to run your containers on an on-prem cluster. You can install the same Kubernetes on-prem that you would use inside of Azure Container Service or Azure Kubernetes Service. Now, granted, in Azure Kubernetes Service, it's quite a bit easier to manage. You can just grab the slider to increase the scale of nodes, and you can just pick the version of Kubernetes and it'll automatically upgrade. When you're on-prem, you kind of need to do those things by hand. The other alternative is to <laughs> go cloud all the way. Yeah, your data is on-prem, but you could lift that into an Azure SQL database or an Azure Managed SQL instance or perhaps a Mongo or Postgres database and run that inside of Azure as well. But what if you really, really want your data to be on-prem and you really, really want your application to be hosted in Azure? At that point, you can reach for Azure App Service Hybrid Connection. And this is actually really beautiful. The Azure App Service Hybrid Connection is an agent that you install on-prem that allows it to reach out into Azure and create basically this reverse connection. Now your Azure Web App or your container running in AKS can reach through that connection to your on-prem database. And the cool part is you don't have to expose your database to the internet to make this happen. You just launch that piece and now your database is able to connect. So if you must have that spot where your app is in the cloud and your data is not, then Azure App Service Hybrid Connection is perfect. All else being equal though, that's decently complex and you may want to keep your data and your web app in the same place, either completely on-prem or completely in Azure. Cool. Any other questions or should we move on to the next? I think that's all the questions that I've seen so far. Are there other questions that I missed, Dion? Moving from other clouds, what's different in Azure? This is a great question. I've seen people move from AWS to Azure, and they're really surprised when they get to AKS and find out that they don't have to play, pay for the control plane. That is just so nice. I've also mm -hmm. seen people move from uh, GKS, from Google into Azure, and notice how easy it is to use uh, Kubernetes there in Azure. It's just really cool. One of the things that I often see people stumble over is, what is it called there? So for example, maybe I have a Lambda function inside of AWS, and I'm trying to move that into Azure. What should I use there? Now, if it's containerized, the cool part is I can just put it inside of AKS along with my other Kubernetes content, and it just one runs just fine. I'm using kubectl to push that content into place. And so much like I was using kubectl to get it into my previous cloud host, I can use kubectl to get it into Azure. But if I'm using, um, 
Lambda, I might choose to move that to Azure Functions. If I'm using Fargate, I might choose to move that to maybe AKS, maybe Azure Web Apps. If I'm using uh, uh, Red Hat OpenShift, then a good analog is to find a good dashboard that runs on top of um, AKS. Maybe you'll use the built-in Kubernetes dashboard, or maybe you'll look at Schooner or uh, Portainer to give you that extra visualization. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Rob. Siegfried you... asks a great question. Can you discuss web and REST services like Node, Node.js inside replica sets? Is it necessary to have a cache shared by all the replica set instances? I cannot find such a cache for Node. That's a great question, Siegfried. As you start to scale out your application running inside of containers, it depends a whole lot on the needs of your cache, but each instance is going to be a separate piece. So if you're only caching static data that doesn't change very often, maybe you're caching the countries in the world or the states in your country or product lookup details that don't change often, then it might be easier, simpler in a design mechanism to just have a unique cache per instance. So at that point, maybe in Node, it's just a static list, a singleton. Alternatively, if you have data that is changing frequently, you might want to look to a shared cache. Uh, Azure Redis Cache is a great service there because it's just native Redis, but Azure is managing all of the details of how you get it started and how you connect to it and making sure it scales out and, and stays running. So the beautiful thing is now you just have a Redis connection from inside of your Node app, and you just save whatever data you need to there, and all of the other instances get that. Now, what's really cool is if you upgrade to Redis Enterprise, then uh, you get great features like PubSub or storing additional data sets or uh, great uh, machine learning search and content like that. And all of that is now available in this shared Redis cache. Awesome. The cool part about that is even if you're consuming it from another language like Python or C Sharp or Go, it's still Redis, so grab your client of choice from that language, and you can connect, connect to the cache as well. Yeah, I've uh, I, with my experience with Redis cache, uh, get some extremely great performance, like uh, response times of just in a millisecond when you have like you know literally you know tens of thousands of records. So it's 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 really awesome. Okay, let's move on yeah. to the next uh, conversation talk, the last one, and. Uh, I think we hit 9.30, but I'll, I'll be very, very quick with this one. So design factors uh, when you want to you know, use Azure to do the service for your, your project uh, and your work. So you know, uh, you know, key thing is obviously uh, kind of compute, uh, your compute layer, um, and the amount of nodes you want. So I, I would recommend always a minimum of like a, a VM size of a DS2, uh, DS3, a V3. You know, to, at least two virtual CPUs at the, at the minimum. Uh, ideally four, um, even in dev test scenarios. Okay. Um, also, design uh, factors. A key one that's uh, unique to Kubernetes is like is uh, your data, uh, how stateful it is. So there's many options. Like um, the easiest is to use it's just an external database, um, <clears throat> like the Azure Azure SQL database uh, externally. Or you can have a database in Kubernetes service, but you have to manage it with something called a persistent volumes and and using a mechanism for persistent volume claims to um, you know produce those uh, persistent uh, like those volumes, um, which is like you know occupying disk and this is part of the uh, Kubernetes uh, service. So when pods um, uh, you know like part of each Kubernetes pod. Has a life cycle, it, you know, uh, it, you know, it lives and dies. Then you don't lose the the, the stateful data, right, um, of your kind of your, your database, right? So, so managing state is is, is another one. Um, also, design factors. Uh, a big one for me, I think, is is kind of operational, like meaning, um, you know, keeping things steady, reliable, robust, uh, having the right um, monitoring. Uh, logging and monitoring in place. Um, uh, one good uh, choice I like to do is with uh, 
uh, Prometheus and uh, the Fauna. Um, uh, another design factor is obviously uh, that's unique to Kubernetes is having a microservices architecture, right? And so it's it's really recommended to have some kind of service mesh, whether it's console, Linkerd, or Istio. For me, or and this is also the newer open service mesh, so I um, buy or uh, it's open source with Microsoft. Um, but Istio is, is what I have uh, a lot of experience with. And uh, service mesh helps with traffic routing, blue, better, easier blue green deployments, you know, circuit breaker patterns, um, uh, and, and all sorts of that, uh, all sorts of things like that. So, so uh, you know, those are a quick rundown of kind of design factors that you want to, that's, you know, you want to pay attention, particularly with uh, Kubernetes, right, uh, in Azure. So uh, to wrap up, uh, any, any last questions? Harun asked a good question. Will Azure Container Apps be a competing or a complementary service? Great question. Azure, con Azure Container Apps allows you to run, um, Azure Container Apps allows you to run containers, but they manage all of the Kubernetes bits for you. So not that unlike Service Mesh, if you've got a bunch of containers and you don't want to manage a, a container orchestration runtime, then Azure Container Apps might be a great choice. Alternatively, if you really want to get you know, native Kubernetes and you, you want to be able to manage that, um, be a whole lot more uh, community focused, CNCF focused, then Azure, can, Azure Kubernetes service might be a good choice. Ultimately, will they be competing or complementary? I think it, it kind of matches our previous thought of Azure will meet you where you are. And so if you have lots of microservices and you don't want to measure, you don't want to run an orchestration engine, then Azure Container Apps will probably be the one that meets you exactly where you need to be. By comparison, if you want to take more control over it, then you may move to then Azure, Azure Kubernetes Service, AKS, might be the one that is the easiest reach for you. Ultimately, I don't see them competing as much as hitting different markets, different needs, being able to better match the needs of users across various uh, ecosystems. Great question, Harun. Okay, cool. Any any other last questions? I'll take one or two more. I think we've got it. This has been a really, really fun conversation. I've really enjoyed getting to chat with you, Roy. And uh, I'll hand it back to you, Dion. Perfect. Thank you both so much. That was awesome. Um, I have gone ahead and shared a few links in the chat. So we have um, a link to the rest of the table talk sessions, which are happening later this week, um, all different locations, languages, time zones, so you can check those out. I also shared a link to our Reactor email sign up if you're interested in finding out more about what sessions we have coming up. Um, and then finally, right now, I'm going to share a link out to our survey. If you do have a few minutes, we greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, it will ask you for an event ID. The event ID for today's event is 14806. Um, and that is in the chat as well. And thank you again. And thank you, Rob and Roy, for leading this great discussion today. And I hope you can all join us again soon. It looks Siegfried like asked a great last minute question. Oh, I'm not sure if we have a moment to handle it here, but if not, yeah. you can grab me on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich and let's continue the conversation. If you want to answer the question quickly, I'm fine with that. Siegfried asks, Please discuss serverless Kubernetes and Ingress specifically. Can Ingress be serverless? Kind of, not really. Ingress has its own control plane that needs to keep track of things like certificates and um, policies, connection rules, and that needs to be stateful. The cool part, though, is that as you install Istio or Linkerd or another service mesh, it will handle those details for you. You just need to make sure that it has a durable data store available. Uh, Azure Blob Storage, Azure Storage can be a great spot for that. All right, perfect. Does that answer 
Siegfried, does that answer your question? All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again so much. Thank you again to Rob and Roy. We really appreciate you all joining us today and hopefully we'll see everyone again soon. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank Bye. You, everyone.